the Hoover that were really at their peak. They were as big as the Rolling Stones. 18,000 kids were supposed to go through two turnstiles. Got two children in there. I couldn't breathe. I thought I was dying. They're, they're passing people very limp from the front. This guy tells us there's already 11 dead. I think well, I'm going to die, but I'm going to fight. Most of what has happened has been due to trauma. I had to live. I just, I wasn't going to give up. 11 kids have been killed tonight. On December 3rd, 1979, 11 young people lost their lives on this plaza level just trying to get into a Who concert. I'm Tanya O'Rourke. I grew up here in Cincinnati in a little town called Finneytown, where three of the dead lived. We take a look at that horrible night through the eyes of those who were there, those who lost their loved ones, and the surviving members of The Who, Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey and their longtime manager who was there that night. All these lives rocked by one unfortunate set of circumstances that led to a terrible tragedy. Well, 1979, I'd say the Hoovert were really at their peak. They were as big as the Rolling Stones. They were as big as the Beatles. I mean, they were huge. The Who spoke directly to us. Their music, their lyrics, uh, the energy. We want our audience to go nuts. You know, that's how we measure our success. The music is written with this energy. And the Who was on the radio. You cranked your radio up and you drove around Finney Town. The music needed to be louder and louder and louder and louder. We were deafening ourselves every night. They're coming to Cincinnati, and uh, the second we heard about it, I uh, couldn't wait to get tickets. That was cause for so many people. Just to have a ticket was a coveted commodity. It was huge, right? It was, it was big time. It just didn't get any bigger than the Who. My name is Matt Wergers, class of 1979, Finneytown High School. I'm Steve Upson, class of 1979. My name is Mike Simkin from Finneytown, Ohio. Hi, I'm Tammy Hart Fails, class of 1980 at Finneytown High School. My name's Bill Kerbishley. I'm the Who's manager, and I was also the manager in 1979. My name is Guy Nino. I was the chief paramedic for National Medic Service the night of the Who concert, December 3rd, 1979. My name is Dale Minkhouse. At the time of the Who concert, I was a lieutenant with Cincinnati Police Department. The sold out show was here at then named Riverfront Coliseum with doors spanning both sides. But on this side, the West Side Plaza level, thousands of people showed up early to get in line for festival or general admission seating. We used to have something called festival seating, which you would go into an arena and you'd have no seats. So it was a big rush to get to the front. In those days, festival seating was quite common. You had certain reserved seats, but there was always an element down on the floor and down by the stage that was unreserved. Festival seating drew people very early in the day because festival seating is a first come, first serve. You know, those in the door get the best seats in the house or get right in front of the stage. So of course you wanna be there first, get in, get great seats. Right, we were hoping to be on the floor. Be on the floor. And 10 rows back or yeah, whatever okay. was the, yeah. right, was yeah. the goal. The goal. We wanted to make sure we got there early. A lot of other folks had that same idea. We got down there early that day, about 12 noon. We had never experienced a crowd gathering that early. Their Finneytown High School classmates, Jackie Eckerly, Karen Morrison, and Stephen Preston were amongst the throngs of people on the plaza level early that night. I'm Ann Vota, and I'm Stephen Preston's mother. Stephen was in the middle of braces, and he had an orthodontic appointment the morning of the Who. And I said, I want you to attend your appointment tomorrow morning. And he said, I'm not going because I want to be first at, for the festival seating. And that was the last time I talked to him. Jackie and Karen and Steve, I, I remember seeing them. They were probably six or seven feet to our left. So we were, we were all pretty close. It was just a normal touring day. Yeah, it was a normal day. Um, 
We went to the venue. The doors were supposed to open at 6.30 p.m. And our estimate at 6.30 p.m. were 12,000 people were waiting to get in. That was unbelievable. We'd never, ever experienced that before. But there were people who were starting to, to, to push from the back a little bit. I remember there was a group of, of kids who thought it was a joke to just run and jump up into the crowd. When the doors didn't open at 6.30, you could feel that very anxious, that whole crowd, that anticipation. The crowd got bigger, more boisterous. Next thing you know, you're kind of, you know, fighting to keep your feet on the ground a little bit. Um, you're moving involuntarily a little bit. The whole crowd was just moving. You couldn't, you had to move with them. There was no other way. It was that. Type. Yeah, and at times you, feet were off the ground. Right. So you're in the crowd and you're kind of moving. Right. It was 20, 20, 22 degrees that night, and I was soaked from head to toe. Major anxiety of uh, what's going to happen here, because uh, even though it was cold, I was sweating profusely just trying to physically stay upright. The way you can describe it is like when you're in the ocean and a wave grabs you, and it pushes you in and sucks you back, you know? That's what it was. You could literally see bodies doing this. It got to the point where I, I had just two things on my mind, and that was to keep my feet on the ground and, um, and to keep air in my lungs. It got to the point where I, I had just two things on my mind, and that was to keep my feet on the ground and, um, and to keep air in my lungs. When I could get to the point where I could reach my head above the crowd a little bit on my tippy toes and try to get some air, uh, there was just this fog, the, the, this fog from people's breath, uh, just hovering above this crowd. At some point, we heard some music playing inside. The crowd heard some music playing. At that point, I think everybody got really, really uh, pumped up. People thought the show was starting. That's when it was like, uh, the only way I can describe it is if you watch a documentary on bees, one of the bees will say something's going on and the crowd gets buzzed out and that's what was going on. People just started freaking out trying to get to the doors. Of the 16 doors, according to Rolling Stone magazine, on the west side of the building, news and police reports say only two to four were opened, with thousands waiting to stream through. There were 18,000 kids and they were essentially funneled across this walkway that led to the Coliseum and then it was focused down to these two turnstiles. And 18,000 kids were supposed to go through two turnstiles and show a ticket at a Who concert as if they're going to do that in an orderly manner. I don't care how many doors uh, I blame anybody something could have happened to make this event not happen so tragically. When the doors opened, I was behind the crowd and you could actually see the crowd compressed by at least a third. I mean, it was unbelievable to see that many people just crush into each other. You know, my 18-year-old mind, you know, just, just, just having, being focused on getting in there and, and getting in the, in the Coliseum and, and all of a sudden they're passing bodies over our heads from the front of this crowd. They're, they're passing people very limp, maybe passed out, maybe even worse people. And that's when I thought to myself, oh, this is, this is really serious. This is not good. Steve and Doug, the gentleman, his friend from Purdue, right. kind of They were having locked. trouble breathing. Yeah, and so, so they we, kinda, yeah. we locked our arms like that, and the girls were in between our arms so they could actually get a, a decent breath. My girlfriend at the time, she was getting so smashed that uh, I couldn't hold her anymore. I was actually have to lift her up so she could get air. And I actually went down on the ground and Doug, who thank God he was really yeah. tall, he just kind of like grabbed me up. But as you're going down, there's other people going down too. I mean, right. it was, <clears throat> and people were yelling, you know, back up, but people, you 10 people back, you know, you first didn't you didn't know what was going on. Right. And it was impossible to back up because it was that congested and tight. 
At that point, I noticed I was starting to, to, to lose breath a little bit. It was a very, very tight squeeze. You know, if you push down, you're pushing on someone to get up and you can't, there's no ground to step on. You're stepping on like an ankle and your foot's slipping. You're not getting a solid stand. I remember I was with all of my strength from an 18 year old, probably 145 pound guy, you know, trying to, to, to keep some room between my, my body and, you know, just keep some space. People running, pushing, jumping, jumping over walls, barricades. I literally seen people being pushed up in the air and walking on people into the door and a guy grabbing on the awning before the door and swinging himself into the building. Uh, I'm sorry. What just happened there? Uh, goosebumps. Uh, like I fell in a cold lake. Why? Because it's a... Uh, it was a very traumatic time of my life. 40 years of thinking about this and, and turning it over and the circumstances surrounding it, I still haven't completely assimilated. I would have never imagined, you know, people being killed trying to get into see a concert. I would have never imagined you know, people being killed trying to get into to see a concert. Multiple accounts say Stephen Preston was near Karen Morrison and Jackie Eckerly when the crowd surge started. I think Jackie went down in front of him and he went down to help her up and never made it up because the two of them died right together. One on top of the other. My friend is there one minute, and I never see him again. I got over to the, to the wall, to the doors, and that's when a big surge came and pushed us once, and then it pushed us another time. And then the fourth, third or fourth time, the pressure was so bad that we literally went through one of them plate glass windows because of the pressure of the bodies pushing us against the glass. We had nowhere else to go, and the glass broke. They were not opening the doors. Um, not releasing this, this, this massive pressure that was going on outside. I don't know if you've seen any pictures of the clothing stacks that were at the side of each door that had been opened. When these people came through that door, it was like they're being put through a hamburger masher, you know, literally, and their clothes are being peeled off of them as they're coming through the door. I stood up and I, I, looked, at the, uh, I looked at the doors and all the glass, and hundreds and hundreds of faces pressed up against the glass, another vision I'll never forget. And uh, uh, just people trying to get in, just humanity pressed up against this glass. And it was shortly after that door opening that we started getting information there were people down in the crowd. But the crowd was so compressed, we couldn't get in. I had seven code blues all at once, and I had to decide which patient to work on. And my only uh, criteria was who was the warmest and the pinkest. That was it. I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea what had happened. All I knew was I had to do what I had to do. I was watching television and I saw what was going on and of course I was alert and I saw them carrying a kid out of the front and I said those are Stephen's shoes. It's the the mental image of that moment. <laughs> yeah, it was hard. <clears throat> it's just imagining being there. I don't imagine. Eventually, we had every rescue unit, EMT, paramedic unit in the city was at the Coliseum. I mean, we ended up, 11 people died, 25 were transported to the hospital, and we probably had another 50 to 75 that were treated as the scene. Bill Kerbishley, the band's longtime manager, didn't tell the band what happened until after the show ended. I can well remember them going on stage and they were maybe 
like about the second number in. And Larry Maggie came to me and he said that there was a problem up on the plaza level. So I went up to the plaza level with him. And when I got there, it was, it was awful, it was horrific. I mean, there were shoes and clothing everywhere. And the, uh, the medical teams were working on a lot of the injured in an effort to obviously save them and um, I could see I could see for sure that there were a couple there were a couple that had passed away. He's publicly sharing for the very first time on camera why he made the decision to not stop the show. A fire marshal came to me and said they were talking about stopping the show and I said that's crazy. You cannot, and you're not gonna, I'm not gonna allow you to stop the show. I don't know how I would have stopped them, but I said, if you stop the show, I think you'll have more problems on the uh, arena floor. You could have more people being hurt, for sure. And if they came back through this area, the medical teams are never gonna be able to cope with what they're doing. And if keeping my band on stage saves even one life. To me, that's what it's about. It's really, really important. I fully agree that the concert should have continued. I think it would have been an absolute disaster to try and shut it down. I fully agree that the concert should have continued. It would have been an absolute disaster to try and shut it down. It was our manager, Bill Kirbishley, who was at the scene of, of the accident um, and was arguing, fighting with the, the, the police and the fire marshals because they wanted to stop the show, which would have been an absolute disaster because you, you would have had the crowd that was already in the hall trying to get out over the rescue workers trying to save people on the ground. So that, he possibly averted an even more calamitous event. And he never really has been thanked in the right way. But I can remember a couple of moments in the show where I just remember thinking, God, this is such a, and a great show. And, and it wasn't. You had no idea that anything had happened? No, no idea at all until we came off the stage and we were all in the dressing room. We, like I say, we came off thinking we'd just done a really good show because crowd reaction was great and um, we played well. It's the first concert I've ever been to. I was waiting for it to end, if that makes any sense. I just wanted to get out. And I don't know why we just didn't get up and leave. And we just kind of right. sat there. We just sat there. I don't think we stood up. We didn't clap. No, we didn't dance. We just, kinda we just sat there. Sat there. In some ways, it's more difficult to see someone, a medical team, trying to save someone than it is to see someone who's actually passed away. Because your emotions and every part of your body is willing them to bring that person back. I remember the concert was a good concert. I remember feeling good about the show. It was one of the best shows we played on the whole tour came off stage and Bill Kirbishley came in and, and said, I've got some really bad news to tell you and started to explain it to us. And I said, look, go back, only do two songs. We've got a real serious problem. I'll explain afterwards. I think they sensed that it was something really serious, you know, by my tone and everything and demeanor that there was something serious. So they went back on, played the two songs, came off, I took them into the dressing room and I told them. And that was like being whacked with a baseball bat around the head. It was just a shock. And I think we did the rest of the tour without really talking to any, hardly anybody in total silence. We hardly spoke to each other. We never spoke on stage. We just played our music. We just lost ourselves in our music. It was kind of weird. And it just didn't feel 
any way to make it right? I went through two phases, you know. One was, of course, tremendous upset and concern, but the other was incredible anger that we had been performing while this was going on. So from feeling like you had the greatest show ever to finding out 11 people were kicked and then And then we handled it really badly afterwards. We, we just handled it really badly. This is just my view. Roger will have a different view and Bill will have a different view, but I believe we handled it really badly. What we did is we left the city and we shouldn't have done it. Because what happened with us is we had a show the next day in Buffalo. So we spent the night, we couldn't sleep, we, we got drunk, we sobered up, we got drunk again, we didn't know what to do, we didn't have anybody come and talk to us, we, we really didn't know what to say or think or feel. And then we got on a plane and we went to Buffalo. I really felt that this was a little bit like being in a plane disaster and then never getting back on a plane again, you know, a fear of flying. Um, so I, I, I really felt that if they didn't play another concert, they may never play again. It was just after we lost Keith Moon, we were a wounded animal. I have to say that we weren't playing at our best. Pete was having you know, kind of problems with substances. So it was a very traumatic time for us anyway, as a band. I think one of the things we're concerned about is it probably would have taken me two days to sober up, you know, because I was drinking flat out all the time. What I stressed to them was that this was really no fault of theirs. You know, they were totally and absolutely unaware of it. I mean, it could have been something that happened in the car park, for instance. You know, it, they were totally disconnected from it. It wasn't of their doing. I don't think we could have done anything different than we did in the end. I don't think it would have helped if we'd stayed. What could we have done? We couldn't have brought them back to life. We ran away is what we did. I'm sorry, but that's what happened. We ran away. We ran away is what we did. I'm sorry, but that's what happened. We ran away. You know, we had an excuse because we had another gig. I'd just like to say, you all know what happened yesterday. There's nothing we can do. We feel totally shattered. The life goes on. We all lost another family yesterday. And it shows for them. I remember. I remember when Roger said, this is for the kids of Cincinnati. You know, I just think, we're in the wrong city, we're in Buffalo. You know, I know what he meant, but I just thought it was dumb, you know. We shouldn't have been performing at all. And uh, not his fault, but you know, you know what I mean. I love Roger, you know, just, that's what, that was his response. And, and um, Mine was probably just to drink another bottle of brandy, so not much better. <laughs> we should have stayed. We should have stayed. Now I'm absolutely positive that I made the right decision. It's difficult. You know, you make a, a decision like that, you're always going to be second guessed or someone's going to say, what if? But you know, there are no what ifs. What if there were no festival seating? We wouldn't have lost those 11. Youngsters, um, what if it wasn't us and it was another band? Which it quite easily could have been, you know? I still don't have adequate words to explain the feeling and the emotion I had there, you know? To be surrounded by all of that and to see it and, you know, it was difficult, very difficult. Despite everything, I still feel very inadequate. And for me, I don't know about the guys, but for me, I left a little bit of my soul in Cincinnati. Yeah. 
I'm still very traumatized by it. It's a weird thing to have in your life. It's a weird thing to have in your autobiography that, you know, 11 kids died at one of your concerts. It's a strange, disturbing, heavy load to carry. No, you don't feel guilty. But equally, you do think, well, if we hadn't been playing the show in Cincinnati that night, 11 people would still be alive. 11 young people lost their lives that night, all of them from the greater Cincinnati area. Walter Adams Jr., Peter Bowes, Connie Sue Burns, David Heck, Tiba Ray Ladd, Philip Snyder, Brian Wagner, and James Warmoth. Plus the three from the tiny community of Finneytown, Stephen Preston, Karen Morrison, and Jackie Eckerly. This is the yearbook, the year she was a sophomore when she died. Jackie was a social butterfly. Yes. She could have done anything. I don't know what she would have chosen, but she would have definitely had a different life than we did. I think it still would have been a humble, kind life. Though. Oh, definitely. Karen always enjoyed music. Had she had the opportunity, I think she would have really followed that love and pursued something in the arts. Stephen was charismatic. He was uh, the guy that would always make you laugh. He was just a guy who was just filled with joy and that, and that spread to everybody that he was around. I think he would have gone into the arts, but he loved music ever since he was, I don't know, three years old. I think what was very hard, it was such a freak accident, a freak accident that that was hard to digest. It was hard to understand that you could be waiting in line for a concert and die. She didn't get to enjoy her life. And because of that, her parents didn't get to enjoy their life. <laughs> it changed us enormously. Is there still a hole in your life? Every December 3rd? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very difficult. We get a poinsettia yeah. in memory, just to have Christmas, you know, with him. That night, um, especially losing three dear ones, it sent a shockwave through this town and through our people um, that's indescribable and everlasting. It took the security or safety of Finneytown yeah. that anything could happen, you could die, you know, made it uh, seem too real. That was about it. It's something as innocent as going to a concert. Yeah. What happened that night changed us all. It changed everything. Um, we were carefree, you know, partying a uh, bunch of kids uh, who threw caution to the wind quite a bit, lived somewhat dangerously at times. You were 22. You were not much older in some cases. And some of the victims. Right. You said that you, you've, you're still traumatized by this in some ways. How has that manifested in your life? I think it's manifested through me eventually and really quite quickly despairing of the who and eventually leaving them in 1981. I announced I was going to leave the band. It was just a couple of years after the accident. You know, I just left the business in the end. And, uh, and that was caused by the tragedy? You know, I think it was very much a part of it. You know, one of the reasons maybe why the scar has been tricky is because, wow, you know, this is the first conversation in depth that we've had about this ever. Are you saying to me, this is the first in depth conversation you've had about this? Yeah. The first dedicated conversation about the accident. Yeah. It took a long time for me to get it off, the weight of it off of me. It had completely enveloped me. Um, and what I mean by that is there, every, whatever it might be, every half an hour or hour of the day, it would come back to me. The whole horror of it, you know, um, and seeing what I'd seen and thinking about the parents of those youngsters. 
because the real pain of death is with the living. Yeah, the scars will never go away. They never do, that kind of grief, you know. I think it's like the scars of someone coming home from a war, a war zone. You, you know, they just sit with you. It's so different when you're dealing with a disaster that's a distance from you and it's maybe strangers, you know. You can have an empathy with something that happens, but when it's your fans, and they're, they're such loyal fans, and they love your music, and they love you as a band, it's losing family. That's what it is. I just wanted to shout out, it's not my fault. You know, that's where I came from. You know, this is just not my fault. And, and I felt also that if I said sorry, or if I apologized, that in some way, that would be misinterpreted, you know, that I didn't feel responsible. I don't feel responsible, but of course I'm terribly, terribly, terribly sorry for the families. As time went on, I can tell you that it wasn't the band's fault. And I can tell you that we never blame the band. We never blame the band. But I never did think it was the Who's fault because the Who were doing a gig. They go from town to town, they show up, they do their job. Talking about it is definitely a healing process. Um, I think that talking about it here and knowing that it's gonna go back to Finneytown, to Cincinnati as a whole, adds another layer for me to the healing process. They didn't die in vain. Safety was improved at venues. For a long time, we didn't allow festival seating after that at our events. We had to have seats. The whole festival seating and, and what happened, it didn't just change here in Cincinnati. It spread across the country. Well, the fact that festival seating was banned for a while, and I thought that was a very good thing. Now, guess what? They're doing festival seating again. But don't, don't people learn? I've never looked at any of the footage uh, um, of any of it. It's in my scrapbook. Uh, it's not easy reading. It's not, the pictures are hard to see. You know, you can see people that are covered up. There's obviously dead bodies there, you know, so you can actually see some of the kids who died. It's very, very moving and disturbing. Now, I've only maybe got 20, 30, 40 people that I remember who've passed in my life that I really care about. But, uh, you know, the, the 11 from Cincinnati are uh, part of that number. This is 40 years since the event, and Finneytown High School runs a foundation in honour of the, the three students that they lost, which is a very worthy cause. And we're talking about it because I think, you know, the, the parents and the people of Finneytown need to be applauded for not letting go of the memory of those people that didn't make it that night. I think it's really good. So what they've done is created three scholarships, again, in, in the three Finneytown students' names, and they award three scholarships each year to a graduating senior who's gonna be pursuing something in the arts. And we got the Memorial Plaza there. We have a Memorial Shadow Box inside. I like the fact that they're giving scholarships to kids. Um, it's very nice that he's remembered that it's not just pushed under the rug. So maybe it wasn't all in vain. Well, God, one hopes that something good comes out of it. Um, and you know, the fact that the families and members of the, of the community in Cincinnati have put a foundation and a scholarship and endowment uh, for this is probably one of the nicest things that you could do to remember the people who died and the people that were hurt. Now, Superintendent here, it's nice to have you here. I went to Finneytown last year and I'm really glad I did um, and saw the wonderful work that they, they, they do there with their scholarships for the three 
three people they lost. When he first arrived, he wasn't quite sure what we would feel like, but everyone was, had open arms because no one felt that he was at fault and he was more comfortable as, as our visit went on. Can we hear you in the doorway? Yeah. 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 I just thought it was very, very important um, for me to convey one message to Roger, and that is I want you to know that the, we never blame the band. And I got a chance to tell him that. And um, it affected him. I could tell he was struck by it. Since last year, since going there, I felt a lot better about it. But every time it comes around to December the 3rd, it's in my mind. It I thought was, it was just so important that he, that Roger even came, spent the time to come to Cincinnati to visit the families. It was just so amazingly kind of him. Maybe it was good for him. I'd like to think it was. It lifted a load. Look what is happening because of Jackie and her friends. Look at the good that's happening here and the scholarships that are being given out. So it was senseless, yes, but it's, it's doing good things. Something bad has been turned into something good. In the 40 years since the 11 died at the Coliseum, the Who has played in nearby towns, but they've never returned to play Cincinnati. I don't think they'll ever come back to Cincinnati. I think it would, it, would, it would go a real long way for them to set it aside, come here and give some closure to those in need. They should come back and play. That would be lovely. I think it would be very cathartic for the band to play in Cincinnati again. I think it would allow them to move past the memories and create new memories. Is it time to come back? Moving on, it's the name of The Who's current world tour, a tour Daltrey told Rolling Stone magazine could be the band's grand finale. No one knows what it's like to be the bad man. We caught up with them on their final stop in the U.S., Seattle, Washington, knowing they haven't forgotten what happened 40 years ago. What would you now say to the people in Cincinnati? Those folks who lost, who loved, who went, the fans, whatever. I would say to them that <clears throat> I found that my heart's big enough to have them all in it, really. And I know that I'm talking about a lot of people who may be the children or siblings or whatever of some of the people that were either injured or died. And I might, I might not be talking to people who actually were there, but I know that this damaged the whole of Cincinnati. So I would say to them that you know, there's a special place in my heart for all of them. Is it time to come back? You know, it's taken us all this time to get to a place where we could even consider it. I think we would be so nervous, so nervous of talking about it, so nervous of bringing it up, so nervous about somebody shouting at us in the street as we go into our hotel, just so nervous of all those things. You know, I don't think we have done anything wrong, but I do think it also required a real push from the community in Cincinnati to make it clear that they wanted us back for a reason of uh, reconciliation rather than accusation, rather than come back and pay your dues, rather come back and just be part of our family. And that's the message that we're getting now. And it has taken a long time, I think, for everybody to get to that place. But if they wanted to go back, I would be totally 100% behind it, 110% behind it. And if we went back, <clears throat> I feel that we could also help then the community to heal themselves as well. I'd have no objection to going back, none at all. 
And I have to say, you know, we need to go back to Cincinnati. You know, we do as soon as we can. And I think, uh, I spoke to Bill about this the other day and he brought it up and I said, come on, Bill, let's just do it. You know, let's just do it. Let's do the whole show for the, for the endowment fund. Let's just go and do it. You know, it, 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 nothing like it is ever going to happen again. And it would be such a joyous occasion for us and such a healing thing, I think. I could go back to the city, but I don't think I could go back to that, that venue. I saw enough that night that I don't want to revisit. But to see the people of Cincinnati and maybe have some of the people, those that are still around to attend the concert would be something really fantastic, I think, you know. I really do. That would be closing a circle for me. You know, we close the show, we end with Barbara O'Reilly, but, but uh, we close this show with Love Rain On Me and I can't think of a better way to, to just reconnect, you know, it would be great to do that. So what I want to say is that we'll be there. And having said that, now we'll just have to come. Well, Pete says you're doing it. Did he? Well, if he said that, I'm, I'll do it. Only love can make it rain Like the sweat of lovers laying in the fields Love, rain on me Only love